been asked to tell you our expectation as Christian men, even as God will give you opportunity to govern us in 2023. And the first issue I want to raise with you is that don't forget your call Christian politicians. I think uh, Sister Tasi dwelled a lot on that, but I just want to emphasize at whatever capacity God will be giving you opportunity to serve, don't forget that first of all you are a Christian and that will help you. Then number two, our men are very much concerned about the issue of security. I just want you to note that personally, once it's getting to 6.30, 7 in the evening, I become a bit restless. I don't know what is going to happen. And most times, until it's 3 in the morning, that's when I begin to have a sense of relief. And it's not only me. Most of you live in Rayfield, but the people electing you are not in Rayfield. You have security that are following you. You have security details that are all over you. More than 90% of the people you are governing, they don't have this privilege. So security should be topmost in your priority. I was coming from Abuja on Sunday, and once we got to forest, there was a convoy, and everybody was following that, that convoy. I was wondering why. So I told myself, well, I don't know why they are following, but let me join them. And we kept following the convoy because they are kidnapping people. So people felt more safe with a convoy where you have some security details. Please, our leaders, you need to do something. You need to come up with a strategy. In the Southwest, they are talking about Amotekun. Our, our Operation Rainbow is almost moribund. It's, not, it's, it's existing, but we don't feel much of it. What can we come up with as plateau people that will safeguard our communities? Then number two, people have been talking about creating enabling environment. I want to say that I don't expect you to give jobs. That era has come and gone. Even at the federal level, the jobs are not there. But I think the reason why we come into leadership is to create an enabling environment. Number one, when, when there is security, you are creating an enabling environment. Then number two, God has blessed Plateau with Kura Falls. We have this place that if our leaders take it serious and turn it around, presently, when you go to Kura Falls, they are just generating about 20 to 30 megawatts. Why? Because they have obsolete equipment. Right from Jayco down to Forest, if you bring modern turbines, you will generate good electricity. Kura Falls has the capacity to supply the whole of the Middle Belt. And why am I interested in electricity? If God helps you to deal with that, you dredge the, the, the water in Kura Falls and you have sufficient amount of water. And assuming you can contribute to the national grid 500 megawatts, that is what will bring people from all over the country. They will want to cite their industries here. And once they, if I, if I am assured that I have electricity, I will want to build my company here. And once they build this company, revenue is going to come, employment is going to come for our children. <laughs> then the, the next thing as men, we think uh, the way this country is going, we are praying that Nigeria will remain one. But I am very optimistic that God will keep this country. But men are saying, this allocation that is coming from the federal government, this $4 billion that is just coming 
and nobody is working for it, it may not be there forever. You go to the UK, the United Kingdom, they don't have anything. But in, in the good days when, when they had plenty money, they invested in infrastructure. Look at our communities. No roads. And I think we can, we can, if we invest in massive infrastructure, if tomorrow this union is not together and we are left alone, you know, some of you will say we are being pessimistic, but in the event where this country divides and we are grappling with issue of infrastructure, I don't think we will be able to survive. So we need to invest massively in infrastructure. We need to work on our water, water system. I don't think it's right that people will be drilling boreholes in their homes. Can we invest to ensure that our communities, we have water. You go to Panshin, the dam in Panshin can supply down even to Shandam to Mikang. Why can't we reticulate all these areas, give water to our people? so that if anything happens tomorrow, at least we have strong infrastructure. Then I want to speak about the issue of public schools. Public schools. Private schools have taken over. And a lot of our children, I keep wondering, this cycle of poverty will continue unless we invest in our public schools. A child, goes to a private school, at primary one, he can read. Two, three weeks ago, Reverend Pirifa preached in this church, and I was privileged as one of the counselors, and a young lady came for counseling. And I asked her, what is the problem? She told me she has finished secondary school, and she cannot read. A boy walks on my farm, he has gone to school to SS1. He cannot read. Are we now saying, I mean, most of you that are seated here, if we were to pay school fees in your days, your parents couldn't afford it. You were, you, 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 you. <laughs> By the mercies of God, you got to where you are. And now we are where we are. We want to remove the ladder. Those other people who whose parents are not privileged as we are, are we saying that they should remain where they are? Or are we going to create a society where no matter where you are coming from, you can aspire and become whatever God wants you to be? I went to science school, Kuru. I didn't go to Hillcrest, and I am a doctor. And my mates that we went to science school with, at least 80% of us went to the university. Secondly, talking about private uh, public schools, do you know that the corruption in this country is because we have killed the public schools? Most, of, most people will have had plenty of monies in their pocket, but all these monies were given to these private schools. So no money in anybody's pocket. I remember there was a year, I, there was foil scarcity. I went to mobile filling station. And I met this attendant, and he was serving dispensing foil to, peop to people in Jerichan. And I challenged him. I said, why are you doing that? He looked at me. He said, sir, do you know why I'm, giving, I'm dispensing foil to these people? It's because I want my children to be better than me. And I don't think it's right. Most of you here, your parents were non-entities. You were, you, you, you were just... You were opportune. God gave you opportunity. And I think we have a right to give other people such opportunities. The issue, the issue of drug abuse is quite rampant. If you look at the rate at which our children are using drugs, it's alarming. And I want to plead with you. Those of you that will become governors, those of you that will become legislators, the availability of drugs in our country is too much. And we need to make legislation. We need to make legislation that will punish drug traffickers. 
that will limit the amount of drugs in our, in, in, in our cities and our villages. These people that are bringing tramol and bringing all these things, we need to have laws that will, 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 will stop this evil that is going around us. Uh, lastly, we want a bottom-top approach. And I think we can only do that. Yes, you all have your agenda. You have what you think you want to do for the people. But can I plead with you that when God gives you this opportunity, I think the first thing you need to do is to do a needs assessment. You need to ask the people, what do you want? It's not what you want. You know, many of you are saying very big, big things. Is that what the people need? God will help us.